Tonight on Frontiers. I'm not going to race under this board. I am not going to race under this leadership. Dark clouds and a dog doping scandal with Mushing's biggest star. As the Iditarod bolts for Nome this weekend without Dallas Seavey, can the last great race shake the distraction? I still have trust in my mushers and our fans. <laughs> Blue skies. This feels like I'm graduating, graduating to the next stage of my life. Dee Dee John Rowe, the sport's ultimate ambassador, ready to hit the trail one last time. I did a rod 2018. The show must go on. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself but a belief that the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. And hi everybody, welcome to our show. This is the Iditarod Show. I'm Dave Goldman in for Rhonda McBride. And I'm John Thompson. We have a little bit of history to discuss. For the first time in five years, the race is heading south. Mother Nature been agreeable, plenty of snow. But we've had uh, quite a bit to discuss this year, John, because that is just the beginning of what we have. First, let's get you to the race map. This is the southern route we're going to take, and we're going to go through places like Iditarod and Shagaluk and Grayling and Eagle Island and then back to Caltag and on in. However, that is just the tip of what we are talking about because it's been a season unlike any other for the Iditarod, the off-season and now the on-season. John, that's just the start of this thing. It really all began and the doping, as we mentioned in the beginning, and the scandal with Dallas CV, which has not gone away. But it all really began at the finish line of last year's race. And you were there. 2017 finish. Mitch CV breaking records. And uh, Dallas CV coming in second place, of course. And after he finished, Nick Petit coming in third. And six hours after the finish, well, about five hours and 50 minutes, Dallas, uh, his dogs were drug tested. Turns out, in April, Mark Nordman, the race marshal, calls Dallas CB and says, Dallas, you tested positive for tramadol, heavy amounts of tramadol, which is an opioid. It is an illegal drug on the Iditarod Trail. Well, Dallas says that him and Mark Norman had a conversation and that basically it was going to be tabled. Uh, it was not going to happen again. Dallas didn't know what happened. He thinks it might have been sabotage. And according to Dallas, Mark Norman took that and said, OK, you're not going to hear another thing about this. Well, come October 9th, Rule 39, which we had never, I don't think we'd heard about Rule 39 until October 9th, and there was a change to Rule 39, placing the, basically the musher had to explain themselves, and the, the liability was on the musher, too, yeah. right? And so that happened a couple weeks later, October 23rd, the Musher Finishers Club, the Iditarod Finishers Club, demanded the release of Musher X. Now, behind the scenes, there was a lot of talk. They said, why would you change Rule 39 was the big question. Well, basically, there was a uh, there was a drug a positive drug test on the Iditarod. They had to change the rule. And now it's like, why release the name of who tested positive for tramadol on the trail? And they gave the Iditarod 24 hours to do so. Iditarod did it. Dallas responded. And here we are. Dallas CV still says he didn't do it. He's over in Norway running another race. We've got the other race. It's already started. Man, and we've just gotten going here. We'll take a break, and when we come back, we're going to be joined by longtime Alaskan reporter Craig Medred. He has got a lot to say on what is a squirrely topic. And the Iditarod actually get back on track. Frontiers continuing right after this. Welcome back to Frontiers, everybody. This is the Iditarod edition 2018. Dave Goldman, John Thompson of KTVA Sports. Craig Medred, you know, you may not recognize the face. Newspaper folks, nah, they stay out of the spotlight unless, they're, <laughs> unless their pictures are on the front page there next to the column. Craig Medred had been reading them for about 25 years now. Uh, he's also got his own blog now, worked for the Anchorage Daily News for many, many years. And we should say before we get going here that this is a recording on a Friday show the Iditarod already underway here on this Sunday. Hopefully it is a clean race, a smooth race. Everyone gets to Nome safely and happy. Happy, healthy, safe dogs. That's the Musher mantra. It is for us as well. All right, let's get to it because as we started in the beginning of our show, it uh, has not been the cleanest of off-seasons for this race. Uh, this is the 46th running of this thing. 
Greg Medjut's been covering this thing for about as long as it's been going on there. I understand, too, skis, too, for some of those deals. A little birdie told me. Not quite as it, long as it's been going yeah. on, but a long time. Right. A little birdie says you don't always take the cush way like those TV and radio folk. You actually, you yeah, know, ski along been with on, them. I've been on ground on the trail quite a bit. That's um, it. Which, and actually, <laughs> it's funny you were talking about using the southern route because my most, my fondest memory of the southern route was so probably 82, 83 and there was no trail, and I remember flying over a guy by the name of Cowboy Smith, mm -hmm. back when everybody had a nickname, who had on these aviator <laughs> goggles like out of Patton's movie, yeah. and they were breaking trail with no trail visible. I mean, dogs just plowing through snow, and it was like looking at the mad trapper of Rat River. I mean, it was like, that whole race was bizarre. And it was a different time, and that kind of goes back to the problem of today, which yeah. nobody really... I don't know how to say this in nice words, but nobody really cared about the dogs then. I mean, they were utility animals. I mean, nobody wanted them dying, but you know, if dogs had bloody feet, if things got difficult, if dogs were uncomfortable, they were kind of like livestock. I mean, you didn't abuse them, but you didn't worry a lot about them. And we kind of, over the years, changed the race to where we are now, where everybody's, it's all about the dogs. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, I don't think anybody ever thought about the implications of that. All right. You've been covering this thing for a long time. Before we get into the details of the findings in Dallas CB and the doping and, and how many mushers and, and the details, the general question, because this is now a national story, newspapers, TV from across the country, across the world are picking up on this stuff. The Iditarod is in trouble, and when there's blood in the water, here come the sharks. Can you remember a time when this race was in such bad shape and been beaten up on the ropes the way it has no, been? No, I can remember when the Humane Society came after the Iditarod about 1990, and their biggest sponsor, which was a company named Timberland, probably a quarter or a third of the budget at the time, pulled out of the race, and they were in a difficult spot. But the Iditarod community was not fractured the way it is now. I mean, the difference now is that it's not just outside interests, it's internal infighting that, you know, yeah. always kind of went on behind the scenes, but quietly, and now it's all out in the open. Is it, is it a case then of, of, of management? Is that the thing? Because again, no matter what the business is, whether it's TV or sanitation or your education, if, if the structure isn't there, is that part of the problem there? Um, I think it's a lot of things. I think social media has changed this uh -huh. more than we ever thought it would. I mean, I did a rod even probably five years would have been able to control this. I mean, they can't control it anymore. I mean, when Dallas CB decided he was going to go off, off script, he was on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, that wouldn't have happened before. He's got the voice now. He's got the voice. Right. I mean, he, he stole the initiative because he had access that he wouldn't have had. Before, he would have had to go through the media. The Iditarod kind of always, you know, the media, we're all guilty, kind of wants the Iditarod to be perfect. Right. So you kind of filter things, and, and it changed. It's different. They don't have their star this year. And no, they, they don't are, have their they star. They are on the ropes here. He says he didn't do it. He says, I'm not the guy, the tramadol. I didn't do it. He's got his expert from down in Louisiana. We've been talking to people. You've been talking to people. Everybody's been talking to people. No, <laughs> no one will ever know. What do you, what, what, <laughs> you know, somebody from watching this from the outside, maybe not even in Alaska, but outside the state goes, what the heck am I supposed to believe here? What's going on up there in Alaska? Uh, and I think the answer is you'll never know what to believe, that this is never going to be solved. Okay. That uh, Dallas is going to insist forever he didn't do it. There's no way to prove he did it. There's no way to prove he didn't. I mean, wh why they didn't find out a way to resolve this before it came to the head it came to is, to me, the baffling and unanswered question. Rip, rip the Band-Aid off in yeah. March and say it's done. Rip the Band-Aid off and in say, March. And say, we sit. stand with him and that's it and we're finished and that's that. And then they move on. Or but, sit down with Dallas and say, look, we go out there together. We say this happened. We don't know what happened. We're changing the rule. Okay. You say, I know it's horrible. I feel sorry for any other musher who ever ends up in this predicament. But I understand the need to change the rule. You know, I did right and I are going to spend time looking to see if we can find mm -hmm. who did this to my dogs and move on. And you know, if they don't look, well, the media is not very good at following things up. We all know that. Right. And it's forgotten a year from now and everybody's okay. I, I just don't understand how they got to the point that we're going to make a public issue of taking on our biggest star. John Thompson, you've lived up here a long time too. Have you ever seen such a mess? Well, you said it. Dallas CB went off script, right? I yeah, mean, he was totally he, he was not complying with uh, what the. So I think it's a management issue at this point, um, a management of the Iditarod possibly. And part of it falls on Dallas CB. I mean, he did go off script. He forced the issue, and he's not backing down. 
And do you see any way he wins that game? No. At this point, no. he, he, the bottom line is he had four dogs at least test positive for tramadol. Yeah. And that is not going to change. Um, no one is going to be able to prove it was sabotage. No one is going to be able to prove he didn't do it. Unfortunately for Dallas CV right now, he has dogs that tested or, positive yeah, no, for that's tramadol. I have. It's you not going to change. You go back to that YouTube video. Did the thing that he hits me in the in the long term is his statement that if only one percent of people believe me, I'm fine with that. Well, that's not true. <laughs> well, I know this is true, but <laughs> one Dallas CV, I'm not fine with that. You know, no. I've just got out here and said no. I'm innocent, and if only 1% of people believe and, me, I'm fine with it. That's only not a winning percent, strategy. If it's only 1%, then he's making a ton of coin on that 1%, though. I want to know what he's making on all those other endorsements, man. But that's the thing, yeah. and I feel bad for the guy because this ultimately does hurt his brand. It does. And if he did nothing, and if he had nothing to do with this, that is sad because just Dallas CV, Dope Dogs, New York Times, yeah, it's Anderson sad. Cooper. It's, it's, it's sad it's, on, on so yeah. many levels for everybody. I mean, it, it's sad how you get past this. I mean, now I did what I was talking about dogs and doping, and the doping problem program's always kind of been behind the scenes, and it's pretty clear that they weren't very honest with it, right. about, with the media about it the other day. I mean, they tell us one thing, they tell mushers that, oh yeah, we get 30 to 35 positives from contamination every year, and I'm like going, wait a minute, you just told me that didn't happen. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know where they go from here. They, I'd say they need some kind of independent body to monitor doping. That you can't, I mean, from what we've seen, you probably can't leave it with them. Do you think that they need to adjust their rules? Because they say they kind of base the Iditarod rule structure on the International Sled Dog Federation. But uh, one of the things Dallas Seavey's lawyer pointed out, Clint Campion, he gave us a sh list of the uh, international rules and the Iditarod rules, very different. Now, Rule 39, yeah, they, they changed it to try to get more in mold with that international rule. And, and, and a lot rules. more specific. Right. But Iditarod says the test for 375 drugs. Have you ever seen the list? I mean, it, IFS is like WADA. They, they yeah. spill it all out. It's all there. It's very clear cut. The Iditarod rules seem very open to interpretation. So that's where we sit. They want to move on. They want to have a good race. They want to see that. You know, watching this from the outside, when you watch the NFL or the NBA or, the, or Major League Baseball, one of the big organizations, as opposed to the Iditarod, the difference is, first of all, there's a lot more zeros at the end of the NFL and Major a League Baseball than there is here. So they can get away with some of those things and deal with it and take that body blow more so than the Iditarod. It seems like the Iditarod started as a small backyard group get-together. Yeah. It's not the Super Bowl, but it's somewhere in the between. And I guess it has to decide where are we going to be. Are we going to get up to that next level, or are we going to try and manage it as a smaller group there, but still be clean so that they're not taking and, the outside hits when this are. happens? And that's where there's another comparison to be made there. I would say that the NFL is having, I mean, I'm saying the Iditarod is having its NFL concussion moment. Yeah. And, and you somehow need to figure out how to address that issue in a way that will sell with your audience. And so far, they seem to be really struggling with that, with and, Iditarod. And from a, on a personal level, and you've dealt with the folks at the Iditarod and the people here in Alaska, and there, and there is a good a spirit about the people here in this state, I think, and a lot of them. And when you deal with the Iditarod folks, I think a lot of them generally love this race. They want to see good for it. They mean well. Yeah, a lot of, a yeah. lot of them love this race. And I mean, most of the people in this race love dogs. Yeah. I mean, you can say what you want, but... You're not out there babysitting 16 dogs, you know, when you're not going to win unless you love dogs. I mean, it's just a pain in the butt. It's a lifestyle. I, yeah, I sat out there and I thought to myself, my it's goodness, like taking, how could you keep doing that's this? That's right. It's like taking yeah. care of a bunch of small children. Okay. I mean, would you want to babysit 16 <laughs> small children every day? Not me, but that's, I mean, that's what it is for these guys, you right. know, from 20 back. It's, they're not going to win. They're not going to make any money. Right. It's this big adventure because they happen to be stupid dog lovers. Right. Um, <laughs> they you know, there's a few people, there's a few people, a, they are. I mean, there's a few people at the front, they're in it to win. They only right. want to win, and it's a different game, and they're, they'll tolerate it to win, but... I mean, for most of these guys, it's about an adventure with a dog team. Right. Happy, healthy dogs get across yeah. the line, and this many percent are trying to keep a roof over their heads yeah. and big kennels, and the rest of them want to, yeah. say, and so check I, off something on the bucket list. You know, and okay. it, used to be, it used to be a lot more about those guys than about the winners. And I can remember in the early days when we covered it for the Daily News, the policy was the whole first half of the race, it was don't even write about the, the race. You write about the people on the adventure. Sure. And the leaders in the race used to kind of complain about, what are you writing about those <laughs> yo-yos for? They don't know what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. 
But we held that policy for a long time, and it, it probably benefited the race. And then over time, the race became more competitive and faster, and it was harder to do that. And pretty soon, it was all we're writing about is the race. Tell me a story. So you want to hear about somebody else other than the person you're going to hear yeah. about crossing the finish line. And the race used to be more interesting. Sure. People used to get lost. The trail used to be worse. Right. I mean, there were a lot of things that helped the storytelling. Right. And that they did a rod, lost all of that in the interest of making the race better. And now they've got problems from making the race better. It's, it's evolution. It's, there's parts you control and there's parts you can't. And the social media aspect, boy, it's a big... I mean, if I'm at Diderot, I'm, the thing I worry about these days is any bad thing that could happen on the trail, mm -hmm. somebody could be in range of it with a smartphone and recording it. Right. Um, I, I, I mean, I think the race from a musher level is really going to have to change going forward just because of that. We've talked that about danger. we've talked about the, the the drug testing and all, but again, the social media because the way this stuff gets out, we're hearing that. It used to be they, they'd film something and the tape gets flown and tracked and da, 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 and the truck and Pony Express and it finally gets right. to Anchorage and two days later it gets on TV and by that point they're 48 hours further down the trail. Now, boom, if you can get a cell service and out there and I know our friends at GCI, our parent company, it's the only time I'm going to say that, <laughs> make sure that you can do things like that at certain checkpoints. That's another part of this thing. So it's not just the drug testing, but it's, it's the way social media has changed it. Everybody's got a voice now. But that's a positive thing, don't you think, Craig? I mean, like you're... Uh, uh, you, it's a positive thing if you really believe what I did or what I sold for a few years now that it's all about the dogs. Right. If, if you're one of those people that it's all about winning and, you know, you, you really don't want somebody filming dogs in the conditioner and leaving some of those coastal checkpoints that, you know, they're not... Fair point. They're not very happy-looking dogs. Right. Um, and that used to be accepted that, you know, dogs are tired on the coast. They're going to be slow going out at checkpoints. You may, may need to walk them out. You know, they may be moving a little stiffly. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> the opportunities for people who don't like the race to exploit that now are large. I mean, this dog kind of <clears throat> like I do when I get up now because I'm old <laughs> and I've spent a life with a runner. You don't want that on <laughs> right. film. It's like, what's that decrepit old that's <laughs> fair point. Fair point. So, you, look, you look good. Come you on. Look hey, good, you came Craig, in here. Come you on. did that. All right. So you may not be skiing anymore with <laughs> the race, but he, but he can write about it too. He's got he's got this he's got the uh, the stay with it all there. Thank you, sir, for jumping in. Oh, you there. Craig Medred. Craig Medred. He's got the blog. You got to check that out. John Thompson and I coming back. <laughs> a lady who knows a little something about the trail. There she is, Dee Dee John Rowe. She's walked this trail. It's her final race. We'll discuss it with her after the break. Coming right back. Welcome back, everybody. Frontiers. This is the Iditarod edition. Rhonda McBride back with us next week. Dave Goldman, John Thompson of KTVA Sports. Uh, <laughs> let's finish up on that happy note. Yes. I think this is. Didi Jean Roche. She has been one of the bright spots blue skies, if you will, for what has been a lot of dark clouds. And recently, uh, we got a chance to speak with her. She says, this race coming up, which will be her finish, will not define her. It is her 36th running. She's got 1,000 miles to go, plenty of distance, because she's got herself a lifetime of memories to ponder it on the way. He's a frosty fellow. Discussing a lady's age isn't usually proper practice. Yeah. Good, good, good boy. But in Dee Dee Genro's case, it hasn't mattered <laughs> until now. I remember one time saying, oh, I don't, you know, 55, that seems old, you know, and 55 came and went and 60 came and I still wasn't feeling the burden of it. At 64, <laughs> it's caught up. It would be when dog care could be compromised. <laughs> Her hands frostbitten, she cannot care for the dogs properly. You see, it's always about the dogs. Come here, Dad. That's my girl. But this week will also be about Dee Dee, her 36th and final Iditarod. One last trip to say thank you to her fans. I've loved them since 73 when I first went to Bethel, and they will be, they will be my treasure. But she'll run for others, too her late mother. Her membership number for the race was 12. And her father, and a family friend, Jim Culler, who recently passed at 91. 
He'd been building dog houses for her for nearly 30 years. As she travels the South Route, the memories will also flow of her mentor, four-time champion Susan Butcher. They met in 1980. When Susan realized that I was in it for the long run, that I was committed to it, that's when she opened up and began to mentor me. Susan has the honor And the sage advice would keep coming. I think that was 87 was my first top 10 finish. And Susan said, don't overrun that team. You're doing good, you're here, but you're short on rest. Make sure, make sure you hold that rest. Of course, they shared another bond. Susan and I had cancer. I mean, we were both diagnosed within about six months of each other. Susan Butcher died in 2006. Dee Dee took fourth that year, one of 16 top 10 finishes. She also had two runners up in 1993 and 98. Good boy, good boy. She beat cancer and the odds of coming back after the now infamous Sockeye Fire in the summer of 2015. That was our famous roadhouse. We built that. It took almost everything she and her husband Mike owned. Almost. You have a split second to decide what is the most important thing in your life, and it was, had been decided. It was my dogs. And I just grabbed every dog on the place but Python. He was scared and didn't come, and the smoke was coming in. Now, as she gets ready to run, even that fire has come full circle. Every dog in the team was either born right after the fire that fall or I took out of here. <laughs> Hi, Pipey. That's my boy. Whether it's a couple of years or a couple of decades, she is the bridge. In some cases, I've got kids come up and go, my grandma, you're my grandma's favorite. And it's just really sweet. I'm not getting any sleep, and when I do get it, laying out on the ice... Is Having learned many of her lessons the any. hard way. A good schedule for dog f feeding. I didn't know anything about clothes that would work in bad weather. Zippers that would go up and down. You know, the zipper on my first parka froze, and I couldn't get it off. And I didn't know that you don't take your shoes off and sleep on top of them, and then they're flat as a pancake, and it's 50 below, and you can't get your foot back in them. Um, you know, I, uh, sled bags and sleeping bags, you know, those, those are two things I wished I'd known more about in those days. <laughs> There's a lot of things. So call this a commencement. This feels like I'm graduating, graduating to the next stage of my life. Or a coronation. I'm working with some um, early stages of search and rescue because we always meet them in the Hatcher Pass area. And my race dogs are, I did bike during with them last fall and I, I'm really excited. I've got some ski during opportunities too. And so I, the graduation is, whoa, yay. Look at all the time I'm gonna be able to do all these other things. And so I'm excited. I can hardly wait. Bye. Call it what it is, a 1,000 mile victory lap. <laughs> She's the best, what a treasure. Great sense of community, almost time to go, but before we do it, um, you know, we do it for football season, pro picks. Who's gonna win it? Why not? Let's go for it. We're gonna do it just like we did, well, now that, you know, now that the Eagles have taken care of business. All right, so let's get to it there. Who's gonna win this thing? I've got my pick there. You know what, I, I'm gonna go. Oh, I, well, think, I think this is me real first. quick. Okay. This is me, I go champion's advantage, Mitch yeah. Savy, number one. Nick Petit is on fire this year, yeah. and I like your Olsen. You know, uh, I was talking to Dallas Savy, he says the best mushers come from Norway. Allie Zirkel, perennial yeah. favorite. You can't, you can't even decide. Mm -mm. I'm, I'm going with Allie, I said, why not go with it? Uh, Allie, Mitch, your, why not? Mm-hmm, what the heck. Uh, that's it for us, looking forward to it. Onto the trail we go, Rhonda back next week. Good luck, mushers, dogs, good people. Godspeed, we'll see you in Nome. Take care, everyone.